Good afternoon. This is Scarlett. Sounds Great, wonderful. Okay. Great. Excellent. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. We've reached our start time. All participants have been muted, and you can press star six to unmute if you'd like to contribute during the webinar, and then star six again to remute yourself. This meeting is being recorded, and the recording will go out after the meeting. Please check out the attachments pod for the slides from today's meeting and the network map mapping tool. This presentation was made possible by the Preschool Development Grant Birth Through Five Initiative from the Office of Child Care, Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the U.S. Department of Education. We're excited to have our presentation on strategies to engage home providers today. And uh, now I'm just going to turn it over to Jim Lesko to get us started. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, to those of you who are able to join us today. Uh, so on Monday, um, we um, had uh, Scarlett uh, Bowder and uh, her team uh, talk to us about uh, strategies to engage uh, families um, as a part of the uh, PDG Birth to Five process. Um, and a, a second uh, technical assistance request um, that we, we, we have received from a number of states uh, was how to create a better and stronger connection with our family child care um, home provider uh, networks, um, <clears throat> especially uh, encouraging those family uh, child care home providers to be a part of the planning process, both in the needs assessments as a part of the PDG Birth to Five effort and um, the simultaneous uh, strategic planning effort. Uh, family uh, child care home providers um, uh, make available um, uh, a very special um, and unique um, early, early learning experience uh, for a number of children and families, um, and uh, enabling uh, those of you to create um, a better and stronger bond uh, with those providers uh, is, is really important. So we're glad to be able to uh, kick off um, this communities of conversation today. Just um, as a reminder, uh, the invited participants to today's uh, community of conversation include the PDG Birth to Five grantees um, and their partners and their consultants. The PDG D5 technical assistance team is on the line today. Uh, the federal project officers and the regional office representatives and their teams have also been invited, um, as have our PDG B5 technical assistance partners such as the State Capacity Building Center um, and their additional uh, technical assistance center partners. We always like to remind everyone that um, participation in the communities of conversation is voluntary on the part of the uh, PDG B5 uh, grantee audience. Uh, um, today's presentation is a part of an ongoing uh, select communities of conversation that we've made available um, based on the technical assistance request that the PDG B5 technical assistance team has received um, since the initiation of the grant in 2019. Uh, we have um, all of the presentations, the power of the slide deck, um, and the uh, closed caption narrative from each of the communities of conversation located on the Office of Child Care uh, Technical Assistance PDG B5 webpage and we'll be happy to make that link available to you um, on this site today. Um, we do encourage everyone to um, please utilize the chat. We see uh, some have already uh, joined in and let us know where you're from. A welcome to all of you. If you do have a question during the presentation today, um, uh, please write it into the chat. We pay close attention to the questions and comments that come in and uh, we'll be happy to uh, share them uh, along with the rest of the audience. The presenters do have access to those questions as well. And um, so uh, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Scarlett. Uh, Scarlett, um, as we did on Monday, if you'd like to introduce yourself um, and the rest of the group that will join you today, I'll turn it over to you. That sounds great. 
Thanks, Jim. Uh, again, my name is Scarlett Bowder. I am president and co-founder of Advocacy and Communication Solutions. We are a firm that's actually based in Cleveland, but I am in Columbus, as well as Nikki Rice, who you'll also hear from. She is in Columbus. We are a firm that does work all over the country, for the most part working with local and state government, nonprofits, and philanthropic organizations on, as our name suggests, communication, advocacy, as well as strategy development and capacity building projects, usually large-scale landscape shifting projects relative to five very specific topic areas with which we have intimate knowledge and understanding from a policy, politics, process, an administrative perspective, and those are early childhood, K-12 education, workforce, Medicaid, and health and human services. And as everyone on this call knows, all five of those areas are inextricably linked. Um, and we all know how critical those are in, in the interplay to the success or re related to the challenges that we might see in this field. Relative to PDG, we, we again, we've done early childhood projects all over the country, but relative to PDG, we're working with a few specific states throughout the country, um, Louisiana, Indiana, Michigan, Oregon, um, and a few others from a, from a uh, technical assistance perspective. So we are very well aware of the requirements and the demands that are on your shoulders right now with regard to this grant, but not only previous to this moment, but right now and moving forward, that it's just something that is going to continue to be quite demanding. So we are hoping that with this conversation today, we will not, not only give you some new ways to think about and do things, but some perspective from those who have been on the ground and in your shoes. And in that vein, um, the other person you will hear a little later on in the webinar is Director Joy Bivens. Um, Director Bivens is the director of the Franklin County Department of Job and Family Services, located here in Columbus, Ohio. And they have, they are a county agency that works closely with the state of Ohio and other stakeholders in the early learning space around a particular project related to the state's quality rating improvement system. There's a mandate in Ohio that all providers must be rated by July of 2020 or they will lose their subsidy, child care subsidy payments. So again, you'll hear in more detail a little later in the webinar, but Director Bivens will walk through the outreach strategy that they have built and been quite successful in doing to help meet that mandate. And a lot of it crosses over with some of the challenges that states around the country have and continue to have with regard to providers, in particular home providers, that are sometimes difficult to engage and successfully build relationships with. So with that, um, as you can see in front of you, the discussion structure, as Jim said, it will be interactive. Please, if there are questions you have all along the way, you do not have to wait until the end. We'll have spots for Q&A throughout the conversation, but if you think of things, please send along a question. We'll answer those as they come our way or as it's relevant to the discussion. Um, so right now, ACS will outline uh, best practices relative to outreach for providers, particularly home providers. We'll open it up for Q&A and then have Director Bivens talk about their work, open it back up for Q&A, and then outline a tool that we have successfully used in the field as a firm and some of our clients have used to really map out the who, what, when, where, and why around engaging certain audiences to help you get to a place where you are able to better engage providers in general, but particularly home providers, because we know that is, that is um, a particularly significant barrier to overcome, especially depending on where you are geographic, where they are geographically. Um, and then we'll uh, wrap up with Jim. So look through. So again, we'll big picture 
we're going to be defining, we're going to be walking through each of these topic areas. And again, as we have our conversation, please send along questions as they pop up in your head. So when thinking about engaging home providers, and this sounds, some of the, some of the content on these slides may sound very logical, but in the extreme business of your everyday lives, especially relative to PDG, these key questions are sometimes lost in getting to how, what, who, what, how, why, and when are we going to be engaging these providers. This is something that Director Bivens will speak to as well and that we walk through with her when we, um, when we started the project with Franklin County. And sometimes they're a bit vexing um, because they're big picture questions that many times aren't asked, again, because of the busyness of the everyday work. So for your agency, what do you need? Is it a compliance issue? Is it just specific that you need to, specific to the PDG grant that you need to do this outreach with home providers? Is it related to a mandate? And it could be all of those things or a few of those things or some things I didn't mention. But at the end of the day, making sure you have a clearly defined goal and purpose about the out on the outreach. And it must be, I think what we've discovered from a best practice perspective, the purpose and goal has got to be beyond a particular mandate. So for example, in Franklin County with Director Bivens, Certainly they had to reach the mandate, but she knew she had to develop, begin to develop and enhance and strengthen the partnership and the two-way communication with those providers for a host of reasons, not only because of the compliance and the mandate at the state level, but because it would strengthen the relationship between the agency and her target audiences, those that she serves and walks through their doors every single day. So that was very a very clear goal and a clear purpose from the outset, and it allows people to better understand the details that are subsequent to identifying the goal and the purpose. For providers, many times, uh, you know, I have been a, I was a former state administrator here in Ohio for the agency that handles early childhood uh, matters, and many times we tend to lean on, well, we need to do this outreach because of this mandate or this compliance, or because of this, we need to develop relationships, which is all well and good, but we rarely ask, why should those providers care? Outside of the mandate, how are we communicating to them why this is valuable, why the engagement with us, why the outreach, why they should be respons responsive to outreach, what is the value to them? Why should they care about that, hopefully, the two-way exchange? In Franklin County, they wanted to make sure that for the long term, they were building relationships that could help break, in some ways, intergenerational poverty and provide greater capacity local, locally um, around provider knowledge and awareness around the importance of early learning and among parents um, about the importance of early learning. And in that conversation, they understood, they realized there was crossover. They had things they cared about. Providers had things they cared about. And I know they'll get into that a little later. But when those two needs cross over is when you have the greatest potential for success and forward movement. And again, based on outreach strategy, that shared need is the thing that's going to drive and win the day. Um, and the, the start of solid messaging begins with a clear goal and purpose. Without that, whatever is said or done subsequent to that can be significantly more successful if that goal and purpose is clearly defined and the shared need is communicated with providers. So what a question we've received over the years is if we need to engage providers, um, home providers in particular, 
sometimes they are very tough to depend on what what type of database your state has, how clean it is, how often it is updated, um, how how manip how if you can manipulate the data in real time because we all know providers close, they open, they change names, they change hands of ownership. So we get the question quite a bit that, well, we know sort of where they are, we have a database, but who do we engage first? And that was something that, um, at least with Franklin County and other work we've done, we wanted to first determine who are the active and engaged providers, who are those that are active, interactive, even if they're critical. We want to make sure they're, they're active and critical for a reason, they're engaged. So um, lassoing that energy for good or for bad or for somewhere in the middle that if you have a list, if you can identify those home providers that are most active and engaged, highlight those, put them on a separate spreadsheet, make sure that you're able to say, look, this is our core group of providers who some are very engaged and positive, some are critical, but these are the people who clearly talk to other providers and talk to parents. So sometimes that is, there's a level of hesitancy identifying providers in that way, but it is critical to the success of any engagement strategy that you do with providers in general, but certainly home providers. They all talk, they all engage with one another, um, whether it's in person or online, they have those relationships that long term will be very critical to leverage. Provider associations and nonprofits, again, very logical, but sometimes there are quite a few of them out there. Some are more helpful, successful, efficient, and collaborative than others. We'll get into this, Nikki will outline network mapping later on in this conversation, but listing out who those organizations are and why they would be helpful to the outreach and how they can be leveraged to engage home providers or providers more generally is going to be important to memorialize. Um, the, the easy to connect with, as I said, the active and, and engaged providers but the easy to connect with certainly applies to associations and nonprofits. And then, you know, existing agency relationships, again, the, that's, a, that's seemingly a logical um, bar to hit, but a lot of people don't look beyond that division or department to say, okay, maybe there's someone in child support who can help us with a particular group of providers or maybe there's someone in Medicaid eligibility, or just the partnership that you have, the partnerships and relationships that you have can be leveraged, so don't be afraid to think outside the box. And then as mentioned earlier, you know, if there is a particular existing or pending mandate, whether it be local, state, or federal, you know, if that crosses over, as did in Franklin County, you know, they really needed to do some significant work in bending the curve on engagement of home providers because those were the people that seemingly were toughest to engage because they weren't part of a formal network like centers are. So really cross-checking all of those things to make sure that, okay, if you want to answer the question, who do we engage first, walking through each of these points, and you'll start to, it'll, it'll feel overwhelming at first, but you'll at least have, at the end of the day, a list of the universe and then be able to pare down and organize and be strategic about the actual engagement, which, again, we'll talk about in just a little bit. So how do you engage them? We, we always talk about our list of always, which I'll get through in a second, but the network mapping, that's a tool that helps you organize the previous five points that I just walked through and then uh, what to say, who is best to deliver those messages, and then some suggested or best practice appropriate strategies. So on how, we can talk about the list of always. Um, and again, seemingly logical, but we, in a government setting, again, as a former administrator, we tend to lean on one-way communication 
and maybe quarterly engagements. While quarterly engagements are a heavy lift from a state agency perspective, the, the work that's done in between is really about the relationship building. So never one and done, the two-way communications, allowing that whatever communication you have, whether it's in person, online, um, or digitally, or texting, allowing that to be two-way and allowing for questions and follow-up. Culturally appropriate, um, you know, the early childhood space is very focused on culturally appropriate services, engagement, but sometimes we do forget that, that the cookie cutter approach, especially for um, new Americans, English language learners, especially child care providers who are, whose language, whose primary language is not English, sometimes strategies have to be turned on their head to really get to establishing relationships and building those over time. And then this is something that Director Bivens will talk about that drives her work every day, whether it's QRIS or something else, that for them it's partnership and never penalty or compliance. Certainly we are driven by compliance measures, and certainly there are penalties, but the step to fulfill those that compliance and avoid the penalty is the local partnership, which takes time. We are not suggesting that this is easy, um, but really framing and messaging everything that they do and say through a partnership lens. And as we said earlier in the week, dogged in pursuit, um, never giving up and continue to push, even when numbers look good, continuing to push, which I know we all do every day, but saying it out loud that we have to continue to push to engage particular audiences, especially home providers, um, is always a good reminder. So network mapping, um, and Nikki will go into this in greater detail, but the network mapping allows you to leverage everything that we've talked about in the previous slide to clarify who the organizations um, are that you need to better or more effectively engage or enhance your existing engagement to get to those home providers. Who at the, those organizations, because many times I think we've all been a part of planning procedures or experiences that you just do a laundry list of organizations that need to be engaged. And when you take the next step of identifying specifically who, specifically when you will do that engagement and how, is it phone, is it at an upcoming meeting, um, and why? why? What am I asking them? Why am I talking to them? It provides a whole different level of sophistication and layers to your outreach. It makes it richer, more organized, and more strategic. So Nikki will walk through that, that tool and that process and provide some examples in just a bit. Appropriate messages. So from a best practice perspective, this is what our firm has experienced in states across the country, blue states, red states, purple states, red regions in the middle of blue and vice versa, tribal nations, um, new Americans, English language learners. I think for the past 15 years since we started, we've experienced quite a bit. Um, and this was certainly, for the most part, reflected in what Director Bivens will outline from a, a messages perspective, partnership with providers. They really want to hear that. Um, we want to continue the good work that you're doing. Many home providers in particular, and this is something we've, we've found out, um, especially when you're talking to them about QRIS or standards or when they think you're coming to talk talk to them about standards, they feel particularly um, nervous about people saying, well, what you're doing isn't right or isn't quality or isn't good enough. What we've done is we've found that shifting that frame, shifting that message to whatever we're, you're doing, we want to make it better. We want to build on the good work that you're doing. And yes, we understand the challenges of being a home provider versus centers that, although relative, have a little more capacity from an administrative um, perspective. 
And then for home providers, their local neighborhood-based relationships are many times much stronger than centers. They're embedded into different niche communities, niche neighborhoods, niche blocks, and they can be a mouthpiece for you for better or for worse. So approaching them with the appropriate messages and part of partnership um, can help enhance and accelerate any relationship building and outreach strategies that you're taking on. And finally, just we know you're busy. I think that's where we start every step of the way is recognizing the good work um, and moving on from there. Um, a few more messages. Um, this is really just about many home providers, at least through the research, um, I don't want to say they miss the fact, but they don't necessarily think that they are having an impact on children the way we think about centers having an impact on the development of a child. Um, many home providers still do see their role as babysitting or watching children. Um, and in particular in Franklin County, um, raising their profile, raising their significance, and talking to them about that has helped tremendously. To say you, you offer children quality care, and people should know about that. What you do is important. And by extension, they help parents work, which means that they help businesses and corporations locally get the job done. And although this depends on the community, some child care providers, whether they're home or center-based, some see themselves as a small business, others do not, and actually reject that label. But depending on where you are and who you're working with, it might be an appropriate message to integrate, to say, look, you are a small business engine that makes this community work, that makes this neighborhood work, and you allow large corporations um, to have a reliable workforce because you take care of the children of the parents that are that workforce. Um, appropriate messengers. And this is not a typo. I can't emphasize that we can't emphasize it enough. Other child care providers, home and center, but for home providers, obviously, other home care providers are just knock them out of the park, the most critical messengers. They can, as I said earlier, make or break. Um, some of the messages that get put into the field. I think we've all experienced that if a policy, if they think a policy is bad or a particular administrator is not their favorite, everyone will know. But the inverse is that if they think that the partnership is authentic and you are behind them and this engagement fulfills or responds to the question of why should I care, that also spreads like wildfire. But aside from that, the research does, the research definitely reflects that other child care providers are the most trusted messengers for those child care providers. Um, the balance of the trusted messengers when talking to child care providers are definitely the resource and referral agencies. Again, that might vary by region or by state or by community. Certainly parents. A question we get all the time as a firm is, you know, if, if we're trying to build relationships with providers, who should we arm with messages about how important partnerships are? And parents are key to that. So if parents are echoing your message, it will only help you. Um, elders and leaders in local neighborhoods with home providers, this, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, I think we all know that a lot of home providers are aunts and uncles grandmothers who have been doing that work um, for years, sometimes decades. And this ties back to the first slide about who the involved and vocal and trusted home providers are and leveraging them. And that's because a lot of those elders and legal leaders in local neighborhoods, especially within tribal communities, um, uh, new American communities, especially those elders and leaders are going to be able to 
um, lead in messaging if you're able to develop positive relationships with them. And again, this depends on the community. The faith, the faith community and child care associations depends on the region, depends on the neighborhood, but sometimes they have good relationships with all providers and home providers, and some of those faith-based organizations might have um, uh, a some type of child care um, program themselves. So they can definitely not only talk the talk, but they walk the walk, so they have a different level of trust that's built. So appropriate strategies for engagement, again, this, this might sound very logical, but what we've seen over time is that because home providers don't have a, a building, a formal building location, like an office building or a school or a church, there's a hesitancy to directly engage them face-to-face, -face, whether it's through visits or through other general meetings, but that is where you get your biggest bang for your buck. And some of those initial face-to-face -face meetings are sometimes painful because especially as, as a state administrator, you have to go through some of the um, the dead wood, if you need, from from um, things that have gone on in the past that might have not have anything to do with you, but getting through that through that face-to-face -face engagement. Um, there are many states and communities that prefer to just do digital or radio or flyers. And those are good, but they have to be combined with some level of personal uh, in-person and engagement, door-to-door -door visits. Again, this is time-consuming, but as we've mentioned previous to this, the most significant uh, mes messenger for home providers are other home providers. So doing, getting underneath your belt a few um, home visits to them um, some door knocking to them in partnership, using those strong messages of partnership um, and leveraging those home providers that are active, those elders, those leaders in the local community will spread like wildfire for the better as long as that messaging is, is truly about partnership. Again, the two-way communication, leveraging those messengers, as I said, and if at all pr appropriate, and offering at literal or no cost. Franklin County was fortunate enough to offer a training to help providers become step up or quality rated. Some of us don't have that capacity, but we've done many focus groups around the country and in the home provider focus groups, the little thing could be as simple as materials to support their work. So it doesn't have to be a full curriculum because we know those are expensive, but gross motor skill tchotchkes, fine motor skill tchotchkes, um, there are things that can be leveraged from perhaps other nonprofits, faith-based organizations that help their care become more dynamic and that in turn creates a stronger relationship with you. So again, thinking about the previous slides, um, you know, making sure that you are being intentional about who you're going to engage, why, when, how, and what that messaging looks like. So questions to ask. This certainly is something that every state or region goes through when engaging providers in general, but certainly home providers. And again, just like the considerations on the first few slides, a lot of times there isn't necessarily a flexible database um, that allows you to track who these providers are and when you're engaging them and what that feedback or engagement looks like. So memorializing the work, in other words, um, not only for yourself but others because Authentic engagement is going to be months and years um, in length. So making sure there is an understanding of five years from now who you engaged and why, or even six months from now, um, because that will allow others who come into the fold to be more effective in a shorter amount of time. 
Um, do you know n enough about them? Um, every state has multiple data sources, so it, does that impact you at all? Um, and then is there a person to memorialize and track the activity? Um, we're many times, I think everyone knows, you're only as good as, as the information and the data you're tracking. And this may or may not apply to your scenario, but if, if there's any way to tighten up the data set or really just a souped up Excel chart of the outreach engagement without duplicating things too much, it'll just make your life easier when understanding if what you're doing is effective and analyzing why or why not. So I will stop there. If Again, if there are questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, and if you would like to ask a live question, you can press star six to unmute yourself. So I'll just stop there and see if there are any questions. So I'm going to ask Director Bivens to unmute herself, so star six, Director Bivens, and if you can talk through the goal and purpose of your work, how you engaged home providers, the successes and challenges, and certainly the lessons learned and advice, and you just tell me when to advance the slide, and I will do so. Okie doke. Thank you, Scarlett. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, we um, at Franklin County appreciate this opportunity to take part in this webinar. Um, again, as Scarlett talked about, back in 2014, 2015, during the governor's biennial budget, there was a mandate that went out that required every center, early learning center, home providers and centers to become step up to quality rated. Um, however, with that with that mandate, there were no dollars attached to that mandate. So as the Franklin County Director, um, we allocated dollars out of, out of our TANF allocation. So what we first did was, what we understood was, after we did surveys, we needed to increase awareness and engagement related to the importance of quality um, for 2020 as well as 2025. So we needed to gauge where everyone was at. So we did some surveys to see, first of all, that did the providers even know about it? Second of all, where were they at in the phase? And then what words or what um, terms spoke quality, quality to them? We did those surveys for both the providers as well as the parents, because what we know is those are the best um, individuals to engage in finding that information. Um, again, we target our home providers, our parents and caregivers, and um, also we um, spoke to um, entities that actually worked with people and families in this space. And I think you can advance, Scarlett, unless there's something else that I missed. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay, so when we did the survey, we did this, we did some focus groups as well, and again, asking providers, you know, basically what their level of awareness was, what, what, what were the buzzwords that spoke step up to quality to them. Because again, that terminology was a government term, but we wanted to make sure that we were leveraging um, uh, buzzwords that actually spoke to the individuals and families that were working with um, in the zero to five space. We then worked with our consultant to do some message development ta tailored to the audience. We provided free training to help build the portfolio. And then we also did some door-to-door um, -door interaction where, because what we know is this. Many times there are decisions that are made in four walls and pillars, and there are documents that are giving, given out that do not communicate to the everyday person because it becomes very overwhelming. So we felt that since we had 23,000 children in Franklin County who were receiving publicly funded child care, and back then if 2020 was then, 23,000 of those children would have lost 
their um, uh, their seat their 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 seat at their early learning center. However, um, we wanted to make sure that we were proactive in making sure that we were on boots on the ground, going door to door, talking to our providers um, in in this space. We also leverage other community partners like our faith base, our business community. We talk to them about the importance of um, um, we talk to them about um, you know the impact of this mandate if parents were not able to drop their child off at their center. So we leverage that in you know maybe you don't you know care from it from the perspective of you know people should have child care, but maybe you care from it from the perspective of if this mandate goes forth and these 23,000 children can't go to their center, then these families, moms and dads, can't go to work, which would impact your bottom line. So we spoke the language of the business community as well as our nonprofit community, as well as our faith community. We engaged anyone and everyone who we felt had a, had a, a, a had tentacles and touched the community in this, um, in this, in this way. Again, we engage parents to push for quality because many times, again, when, when the mandate went out, you know, it was to the providers. However, there wasn't a toolkit or something that was developed for parents at the time. So that's why we wanted to make sure that when we did focus groups, we also did them with the parents and creating the, the um, social media, our commercials, our radio ads, one speaking to the provider and the other speaking to the parents in this capacity. Um, and that will be our paid and earned media. And going back to our um, free training to help build a portfolio, one of the things we did when leveraging the dollars is we also um, we developed an app. We provided online training, and we had in-house training. All of those um, trainings, it is a 32-hour approved training that we got approved through um, OCRA, and we're very grateful for that. In addition to, um, you know, again, our app and our online training and in-person training, you know, it, provide, it allows providers not to have to leave their center or their home, their home provider to leave their home in order to get the training that they needed. So you can advance. Okay, so successes. We train. We have trained over half of the providers in the county. Um, over 30% have become star rated thus far. Um, we've done surveys to gauge where has the awareness increased, and we can uh, and we can proudly say it has among public uh, among the public about quality with both the provider and the parent. And we also have stronger lines of communication. Our community is engaged in this conversation. Again, going back to just particularly the business community, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, they may not, you know, be as engaged in, and this may not be, you know, one of the things in their um, viewpoint, but understanding that the workers that come into their buildings every day may not be able to go to work if they can't drop their kid off, they became very engaged in spreading the message as well. And then we developed a broader understanding of our stakeholders regarding um, quality child care. And I'm going to rest here just for a second. When this mandate went out, we heard many terms of, you know, we really only want the good centers or the good homes to stay open. We really, you know, we don't have enough quality seats. And what we found was as we were going door to door and things that we already knew, many of the providers were already doing the work. They just needed someone to come in, hold their hand, walk them through the process, because the, the information was so overwhelming. And in that moment, it was an opportunity for us to educate those, those um, individuals, the entities that were using those terms as good centers, um, you know, we don't have enough quality seats. What we did, what we educated those individuals on and entities and organizations was, that's a value statement. That's a judgment statement. Many of the providers were already doing the work. They were already providing quality care. They just needed to get engaged in the process. And they needed someone to come in, again, and hold their hand, walk them through the materials, get them engaged in a training, and just get them to the information and access to the state so they can um, submit their application for quality. We can advance.
So some of the challenges in doing this, um, you know, reinforcing to the providers that they, are, they were already engaged in quality care, many times because this mandate had been out there for so long, and the materials that the, the providers and the families were reading, um, it was overwhelming for them. So imagine sitting in a, imagine, you know, sitting in a classroom or sitting in a business every day and you receive a large binder full of information and you don't know where to start. And understanding, particularly with our home providers, everyone's at a different educational level. We have, we have home provider administrators that have GEDs, high school diplomas, two-year degrees, but we have to understand that everyone does not learn the same. So getting them engaged again in understanding that it is a process, but one of the challenges is tailoring the, the training so that everyone can be on the same page in um, becoming um, um, trained and ma not making it so intimidating. So um, the other challenges were continue to build and trust in, in partnerships with providers among each other. Um, cur you know, when you have you know businesses in the room with each other, these are home providers. Many there was a, a a spirit of competition where this is my competitor. Um, but once we got them in the room and they shared their best practices, they see that this is a sister entity to them, and those being, having them in the room and being able to share those best practices built a bond between among the providers, especially when they did the trainings on the Saturdays. And then continue to, continue to educate providers about the importance of their role for kids, families, and workforce. You know, many times there used to be a stigma that um, publicly funded child care and subsidies and that type of thing this was just a babysitting um, role for providers. We have moved way past that, and now we're talking about step up the quality where we want to make sure that every young person that enters into kindergarten by the age of five has had the opportunity to be um, in a center, whether it's home or a center base that is quality so that they are prepared and moving up their education level. So we're continuing to educate our providers that their role is so much bigger than babysitting, and I believe that we are there, and they understand, have leaned into that conversation, and they understand the importance of it, um, as well as the workforce community. And then just some lessons learned and advice. Um, the face-to-face -face interaction is very critical. I cannot enforce that enough, especially being a government entity. There are so many laws and legislation and rules that are passed within our large pillar system and it we understand it as government but by the time you get it down to the street level of the community they may not understand it so they need someone that speaks their language that is making this palatable and eclipse those version it for them because it's not that they don't want to engage. They really want to engage. They really want to be a part of this. They just need someone to, hold, again, hold their hand. Because back to what I previously said, everyone's at a different um, learning level. And then um, also focusing on those who do not respond. What we understand is providers are busy with the day-to-day -day of running their business and taking care of their little ones in their, in their centers. Um, and, you know, you can send a mailer out and you can do a robocall and, you know, all of that, and those things are great. But sometimes they just, you know, they disengage because they're overwhelmed with, you know, unclogging toilets and just making sure that the ratios are met and staffing levels and that type of thing. So we are continually to make sure that we are intentional about engaging with those centers who have not responded and then building relationships among providers. We want, We have been... I think we've done a really good job of building relationships with providers and providing them with resources and looking to some of our other contractual partners um, <clears throat> um, like Action for Children, Future Ready within our community for technical assistance and other resources that they may need. And what we know is building takes, you know, building trust takes time. You know, when you go knocking on doors of providers and you say you're with the county agency and they immediately think you're there to inspect them, and then, you know, you have to immediately engage them and say, you know, I really believe, you know, we're here just because we, you're providing quality care, but we don't see you engaged in a training or stepped up. How can we assist you? So we always have to make sure we are unalarming to people when we are engaging with them and our providers particularly. 
So those are some of the lessons learned and advice that we can provide. We can advance. Does anyone have any questions Thanks. for me? So as, as Director Bivens um, indicated, if you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat box or ask her directly by pressing star six on your phone. And as we wait, um, Director Rubens, can you speak to how home providers were particularly unique and what you had to do to get to home providers versus centers? How, how is this the whole approach different with home providers compared to everybody else? So compared to everyone else with home providers, we had to leverage our in-house team primarily with them. Because what we understood is, you know, when you have a center, you can just kind of go door to door, but you just can't pop up at someone's house not knowing, you know, knowing that they have children there and that type of thing. So we leveraged our in-house team that already was do working with these providers um, because we are the administrator of the uh, publicly funded child care program. And then how did you leverage others in the community, like nonprofits or the business community, how did you leverage them to do that engagement? So what we did with them was we convened meetings and stakeholder meetings with them, showing them, you know, the why they should be engaged, and they were pretty much already working with many of the families that we were working with and trying to get engaged. And we also showed them the impact of the mandate if this was had to, if it was going to go forward. So we leveraged them in their resources, in their audiences. Um, we asked them to, we, we provided them with a, a toolkit to send out to their audiences and to their, um, to their organiz their fellow organizations to spread the word. Um, we did again with the faith community, with the business community, anyone that we felt had a sphere of influence, we sent a toolkit out communicating to the um, centers with talking points for them to be able to have that conversations with um, their families. Thank you. So any before we move on, I just want to make sure we don't have any questions. And if Director Bivens, you're able to stay on for a few more minutes, Nikki is going to walk through the network mapping. And one second, I'm just clicking through here. We might have some questions at the end, but please do. Um, Director Bivens is a wealth of knowledge. Um, we know that she is at the county level versus the state level, but I think what ACS has seen over the years is she is leveraging many of the best practices that we know work at any level, but might need to be modified to align with your systems and your existing right. ve communication vehicles. Um, right. But the best practices still apply. And so Scarlett, if I could just shift really, over. Yeah, no, please. Let me just please. really quick. Anyone that is going down this road, I would just ask that they always start in looking at their data to gauge where they're, where people are at and always make sure that when engaging with the community that we are always speaking community language, not technical terms that is over their head, and always being intentional about pulling people in the, you know, I'm going to say the boat with us or the car with us, those business communities, those nonprofits, and showing them, you know, their why. For the business communities, this could affect their bottom line. So we leverage that in order for them to get them to eat, to care. Absolutely. So, Director, just one final thought. If you could, so you've been doing this outreach for preparing for it for a few years, but the last year in earnest with training, and of the 22,000 children in unrated care, um, I think if I'm reading things correctly, you've trained the providers that cover half of those children, almost half. Is that right? Correct. So they touch about 16,000 of the 22,000. And I need to mention, Scarlett, that that 23,000, I don't know if I talked about this, 
68% of those young, those children are minority and they live in the lowest asset neighborhoods, under-resourced neighborhoods in, in Franklin County. That's why it was intentional for us to get on the ground and get out there and talk to people because we wanted to make sure that um, everyone was stepped up, had the opportunity to be stepped up. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bivens. If you do have an extra couple of minutes just to stay on in case other questions come through, that would be great. And I'm just going to pass it along to Nikki. Thanks, Scarlett. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nikki Rice. I'm part of the ACS team, proudly part of the ACS team. And I get the pleasure of walking you through today the network mapping tool. You'll see images of it as we go through uh, today, but it is also available on our website should you want to take a deeper dive or, or perhaps use it for your purposes. So as Scarlett mentioned at the outset, the purpose of our tool is to identify and prioritize relationships with individuals and organizations. And as we do so, help you understand the power of the network and let form new partners. So really this is used to help you specify your relationships and examine the breadth and depth of those relationships. Uh, as in, I want to sort of add on to what Director Brivens was talking about when she referenced the home and center providers. It's entirely possible and probable that as you are thinking through your own communication to those groups, you may have to do separate network mapping exercises in an effort to identify the groups that reach those individual audiences because they might be different. So on this next slide, you'll see a graphic that helps, I think, illustrate the impact that this tool can have. And what you see here is how we think about your ability to prioritize. Sounds like folks may be having trouble hearing me. Um, and I, I'm holding my phone as close as I can, so I think I'm going to pass it back to Scarlett just to make sure you can hear this important information. Sure. Thanks, Nikki. No problem. And thanks for everyone for the feedback. Um, so the network mapping tool is structured, we, we, as you can see, in a bullseye format. Um, and if you think back, of the, about the earlier slides and some of the initial conversations around, okay, who do we go to first? Those active vocal providers, the elders, the trusted nonprofits, faith-based communities, the people who are critical in the mission that you're about to take on. And it doesn't have to be your, your agency's mission. It might be related specifically to a project mission, or in the case of Director Biven, a, um, a project related to a state mandate. So really outlining those that core audience. For Director Biven, it, it was other ch child care providers. It was the business community. You know, her agency is responsible for the state's um, really they carry because they are the largest county in the state, they truly can tilt, for better or for worse, the state's workforce participation rate. And that is directly tied, as we all know, to people's ability to work and, by extension, their ability to have reliable, quality care for their children. So she immediately knew that in her core were, of course, the providers themselves, but also the businesses and the nonprofits that had a direct engagement with those providers. The, the primary sort of is the next level out, perhaps some of those public officials whose um, um, local government agencies are directly impacted, um, corporate leaders, people who can be leveraged to meet your goal, can be seen as champions, strong messengers, those faith leaders, um, association leadership, organizations that won't necessarily be going door to door with you if you so choose to do that, but can be strong messengers and allies in helping to get the work done and the message out. And secondary, um, future partners. Um, an, an example of that 
um, you know, for say Director Bivens is going to be those who perhaps aren't the largest corporations, but your mid-sized and smaller businesses that have small a smaller workforce, but are certainly impacted um, nonetheless. Then your your tertiary um, are those who don't have a direct impact, but can certainly help advance and make, advance your effort and make your life a lot easier. So many times that's in the form of perhaps other agencies that um, might be impacted at the state level, the media, um, and other community partners that, again, don't have the day-to-day -day interaction, but certainly need to know and understand to raise the awareness of why you're doing what you're doing and why that engagement is so important. So if we look into, and again, this is um, included as an attachment, and I know will be sent out, but as you look through the few, first few initial slides of this presentation and talk about the category of organization, as we said, so providers would be one, faith community, nonprofits, associations, other state agencies, your own state agency, leveraging the knowledge and relationships your own state agency has. And if you look at this, so it's the categories, all those categories we just mentioned, and then who specifically, and I, I mentioned this earlier in the webinar, who should be engaged at each of those organizations? Again, this sounds very logical, but once you start to dive into this process, it gets, sometimes it gets difficult very quickly because many times you're used to talking to the same person at a particular organization, but you've never asked the question, well, why? Can that person help us better engage home providers? The answer might be no, it might be yes, it might be I don't know. Um, regardless, identifying that and then identifying what that person can do to help you advance that engagement. Sometimes the answer is they can't because they don't have the trust, or they can't because they don't have the relationships just yet. But um, as we mentioned with Director Bivens, you know, the home providers, they identified those at the top of the list. They identified based on that data set who were the most active and engaged and went to them and asked them to start talking with other providers. They asked them to be a part of the conversations they were having um, to make sure that, as Director Bivens said, they were using language that made sense to providers on the street, to the neighborhood. Um, then that second layer was obviously the, the corporate community, the other nonprofits like the YWCA, um, major churches. Um, and then elders, in particular in the um, African-American community, ministers. Um, so those are some of the types of organizations and individuals. And then their role, as she said, depending on where they are in that bullseye, some had direct conversations with home providers. Some of them promised to engage their congregations or their boards with some of the information and the statistics that were so critical in raising awareness and engagement. Um, and Nikki, I'm just gonna test you out to see if you are any better. Well, I don't know, I'm still in the same place. <laughs> Yep, yep, you're still breaking up. Okay, so I'm going to just continue to run with the ball here and see if um, the Atlas team, if you have any clarifications that you would like ACS to make before we jump into Q&A. Okay, so if, are there any questions, please feel free to either type in the chat box or press star six on your phone to ask that question live.
Okay. The one thing we'll say is that, um, you know, the network mapping tool, will, it's difficult at first, but will help you dive a little deeper into the work that you're doing to be a bit more organized and strategic. Um, it's not to say that you aren't organized, but sort of tightening up and making sure that you are, we're not wondering what to do with our time, so we want to make sure that we are using that time as efficiently as possible and getting the results and outcomes and helping each other to overcome some of the very standard barriers that we experiencing experience in engaging home providers. So let me see. I think we have we might have one question coming through. Um, so one of the questions is it seems the mapping tool can be used for any kind of group. Are there some instances where this really hasn't been able to be used. Um, and that's from Betsy. Uh, I have to say that we, we as a firm developed this tool more than five years ago, and we have used it for very small organizations. We've used it for statewide organizations and everything in between. We do customize it. And if it doesn't, for example, we have six categories of organizations that are listed, but this document, depending on the project, can be three pages of different types of organizations. Um, so, but the framework works nearly every time. That outlining who, so the category of, of organization, who it, who is it? who at that organization needs to be engaged, and then the why. Um, why are you engaging that person? And what will they do to help you achieve your goal? Um, so I'll say this. I'm sure there is an instance, but we have not seen it yet because what we try to do is encourage our clients and anyone else to customize it to make sure they can turn around to their board, their governor, their agency leadership to say, look, we know who we need to engage, why, when, and then that next step obviously would be how. Any other questions before I pass the baton back to Jim? Or so any other questions for Director Bivens? Yeah. Carlos, this is Jim, and um, I, I am mm -hmm. wondering, uh, and I'll throw this out to uh, both yourselves and, and uh, anyone else that's um, on the line, I, I know that folks that are on the line may have joined because they have had challenges in connecting with family child care providers. Uh, but I would turn it around and say, you know, are there uh, some states or participants who are on the line who would be who have had some successes in reaching out to and connecting with the family child care provider community, um, and um, do they are they willing to share some of uh, those success that you know those successes? Um, what what seemed to work uh, for them that you could share with your colleagues that are on the phone? And you're welcome to hit star six and um, just join the conversation. And um, I'll just get everybody started um, <laughs> just because um, uh, a while ago um, I was affiliated with the uh, Delaware um, Early Learning Community. And it, as a, a part of uh, one of the projects that um, was created because we were indeed having some challenges connecting um, uh, one of actually uh, in this particular case we were trying to get family child care providers to uh, join the quality rating and improvement system um, and we found this uh, a vexing uh, situation uh, especially so in uh, what we consider to be our, our more rural areas I know those of you in out west would probably chuckle when you think of Delaware as a rural place, but um, there were, there are some, at least we think so here, 
And uh, so uh, one of the uh, strategies that the quality rating and improvement system uh, put together uh, was the creation of family child care ambassadors. And um, most often those ambassadors were uh, other child, family child care providers who were um, active in the quality rating and improvement system process, um, or they were prior family child care providers, um, and uh, they worked with the state uh, to actually do on-site visits. So I remember the conversation uh, earlier about, um, you know, that face-to-face, one-on-one connection um, is such a valuable um, uh, action, action step uh, that creates a relationship. You know, when, if you call somebody on the phone uh, versus actually having a face-to-face, it's always just such a, a much stronger way to uh, create um, a conversation and hopefully a bond. And so these family child care ambassadors um, were actually going out door to door, um, knocking on doors, um, and introducing themselves. Um, and uh, um, we, we did find it um, to be uh, successful in some cases. Um, and uh, so, you know, that was one strategy, I think, that we found to be very valuable. I'm just curious as to any, if there's anybody else on the phone um, or on, on this uh, conversation today that has um, other strategies they might be willing to share. That is a tough group. Okay, I guess um, um, everybody is uh, who's on the line today is uh, searching for um, uh, strategies to connect with their family child care providers. Um, so, um, in addition to what you heard, um, Scarlett share today, um, um, along with um, the rest of the group that were on the phone, um, I'm going to wrap this up. So uh, thank you very much, um, Scarlett and team, uh, for sharing your, um, your knowledge and resources. Uh, I hope for those of you that were on the phone found it a valuable um, uh, experience and use of your time. If you do have uh, follow-up questions that come out from today, um, please uh, connect um, either uh, if you're a PDG grantee, connect with your TA specialist, or you can email us at pdgb5ta at atlasresearch.us. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback as well um, and suggestions for um, ongoing uh, communities of conversation. Uh, you um, you will see on your web page um, right now a link to the Survey Monkey. You can uh, that's an active link. You can click on that link, and um, that will take you to the survey. We uh, pay attention to your feedback, and uh, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, most likely tomorrow, uh, those who have registered uh, and are online today will receive um, an email uh, from us uh, with a link to today's recording and also another link uh, to the SurveyMonkey um, in case you uh, don't have time to do it today. Uh, but again, we would appreciate your feedback. I couldn't end uh, today's um, communities of conversation without thanking um, the PDG uh, B5 technical assistance team uh, who has been behind the scenes today um, uh, expertly managing um, this web platform. And uh, especially thank you to Evelyn Keating um, and Kesley Shaw for um, their work behind the scenes. And um, I know also to Gauri um, for her expert review of the transcript um, that you'll see. Um, uh, we will post both the recording um, and the transcript and the PowerPoint um, on the OCC ECTAS um, technical assistance web page uh, for PDG B5. So um, if you don't uh, didn't download the information today, 
you will also be able to access this on an ongoing basis. So thanks again, uh, Scarlett and, and uh, team, and thank you, Evelyn and Kesley and Govri, and um, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Bye.